At times, we may underestimate the profound impact our relationships have on our lives. It's crucial to recognize that certain relationships, instead of uplifting you, can actually bring you down. This is a reality we must confront today. We'll be delving into an essential yet often overlooked aspect of our faith journey, the kinds of people whom God advises us to exercise caution around. Additionally, I'll be leading a prayer in the powerful name of Jesus at the end of this message, so please stay tuned and open your hearts to receive its blessings. Now, you might be wondering, are we supposed to love everyone? Is it unbiblical to avoid certain individuals? While it's true that Jesus teaches us to love our neighbors as ourselves, the Bible also provides guidance on practicing discernment in our relationships. Through the Holy Spirit, we've been granted the gift of discernment, and it's a gift we must employ wisely. Consider Proverbs 13 verse 20, which states, He who walks with the wise will become wise, but the companion of fools will suffer harm. This verse underscores the importance of being cautious about the influences in our lives. So, let's explore this subject further and understand what God is revealing to us today. It's essential to recognize that relationships extend beyond casual interactions or social connections. They wield significant influence. Relationships can either act as a catalyst for spiritual growth and a fulfilling life or lead to spiritual darkness and a life filled with challenges. Now, let's delve into the types of people whom God advises us to avoid for the sake of our spiritual and overall well-being. Firstly, let's talk about the gossiper. Who falls into this category? A gossiper thrives on spreading unverified information, often causing misunderstandings in conflicts. Their words can rapidly ignite and spread like wildfire, fostering division within communities and among friends and family. In essence, a gossiper often stirs discord where unity should prevail. Proverbs 16 verse 28 warns us, a dishonest person spreads strife and a whisperer separates close friends. You might wonder, is gossip really that harmful? After all, it doesn't physically harm anyone. However, it's crucial to understand that the Bible equates gossip with sowing strife. Strife leads to division, breaks relationships, and can even escalate into more significant conflicts. Remember that the tongue is a powerful tool capable of building up or tearing down, healing, or causing pain. It's often the subtle whispers and unchecked rumors that have the most profound and lasting impact, leading to significant rifts and damage. When we engage in gossip or even lend an ear to it, we're inadvertently advancing the enemy's agenda. We're contributing to confusion and division, which is contrary to God's desire for unity and love. In John 17, when Jesus prayed for his disciples and all believers, he prayed for unity. Gossip goes against that prayer and contradicts God's divine plan for his people. So what can we do? The first step is acknowledging the issue. If you find yourself in gossip-prone environments, whether with a group of friends, during a particular meeting, or in a virtual space, take a moment to assess the situation. Observe the nature of the conversations, your role in them, and whether they align with your values and spiritual growth. The second step is taking corrective action. It may involve steering the conversation in a more positive direction or even having a courageous conversation. While it might be uncomfortable as Christians, we're called to be light and salt in the world, dispelling darkness and preserving integrity. By refusing to engage in gossip, we are preserving the unity of the body of Christ and dispelling the darkness of division. Next time you find yourself in a gossip-filled conversation, remember what's at stake, the unity of the body of Christ and the integrity of your relationships. Take swift action. It's better to be a peacemaker extinguishing potential fires than an instigator igniting them. Moving on to the second point, let's discuss the false teacher. Who do we mean by this term? False teachers are individuals characterized by deception and distortion. They knowingly or unknowingly present a version of truth that deviates from authentic biblical teachings. Their messages may contain elements of truth, making them initially convincing. However, at their core, they misrepresent and mislead. The danger lies in the fact that these teachings, when accepted without discernment, can lead believers astray, taking them further from the path of genuine spiritual growth. We must exercise caution in this area. 
2 Peter 2 verse 1 warns us, the false prophets also arose among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you who will secretly bring in destructive heresies. Note the emphasis on secretly bringing in destructive heresies. This implies that false teachers may not be immediately recognizable and their teachings can have destructive consequences for your faith, your understanding of God, and your eternal destiny. They drill holes in the foundation of our faith, much like someone subtly drilling holes in a ship's base, gradually leading to its sinking. The most dangerous aspect is that false teachers often blend truth with error, making it challenging to discern their falsehood. To develop discernment, you need to be intimately familiar with the scriptures and seek daily guidance from the Holy Spirit. By relying on the constant and unchanging truth found in the Bible, you can navigate these complexities and stay aligned with God's authentic truth. Remember that false teachers don't just lead you astray, they also lead others astray through you. Your acceptance of false teachings can have a ripple effect, causing others to stumble. So, exercise extreme caution in choosing whom to listen to and what to accept as truth. So, what can you do? First, establish a firm foundation in the Word of God. Make it a daily practice to read and meditate on the scriptures. Secondly, invite the Holy Spirit into your life and seek His guidance and discernment. Thirdly, it's essential not to be swayed by eloquence or charisma. Instead, evaluate the content, not just the container. Ask yourself questions like whether this aligns with scripture, if the core message is Christ-centered, what kind of fruit this teaching bears in people's lives, and whether it draws you closer to God or further away from Him. Therefore, if you identify a false teacher, it's important to distance yourself from their teachings. Resist the temptation to indulge your curiosity, as satisfying momentary interests is not worth jeopardizing your spiritual well-being. Your eternal destiny is far more critical than momentary curiosity. Now, let's move on to the third point, the scoffer. Who exactly are we referring to when we mention the scoffer? A scoffer is someone who mocks, ridicules, or dismisses things they consider unimportant or irrelevant. In the context of our faith, scoffers are those who belittle the principles and teachings of Christianity. They often approach spiritual matters with skepticism, doubt, or outright mockery. For those who engage with comments or discussions online, you might have encountered scoffers leaving remarks. These individuals may challenge your beliefs not out of genuine curiosity or a desire to understand but with the intent to undermine and mock. They treat sacred matters with contempt, often downplaying or making light of significant spiritual topics. Engaging with them can be disheartening as they are often not open to genuine discussion or revelation. Proverbs 9 verse 8 wisely advises, Do not reprove a scoffer or he will hate you. Reprove a wise man and he will love you. You might wonder, why shouldn't we reprove a scoffer? Isn't it our duty to correct and guide? The answer lies in the second part, he will hate you. As mentioned earlier, a scoffer is not interested in wisdom or correction, but rather in tearing down what you stand for. The very essence of scoffing is to make light of something serious or sacred. Have you ever tried to share your faith and, instead of encountering curiosity or respectful disagreement, face mockery? Matthew 7 verse 6 cautions us, saying, Do not give what is holy to the dogs, nor cast your pearls before swine lest they trample them under their feet and turn and tear you in pieces. That's why the Bible advises against engaging in religious debates with scoffers. It's not a fair debate. In fact, it's not even a debate at all. It often becomes a monologue of mockery with you as the subject. This doesn't mean we should harbor hatred for scoffers or wish them ill. On the contrary, we should pray for them as they need our prayers more than anyone else since they are distant from wisdom and God. The point is that you don't have to invite them into your inner circle. You don't need to expose your vulnerabilities to them as they are often attracted to vulnerability, not to heal, but to hurt. So what should we do? The first step is identification. Recognize who the scoffers are in your life, whether they are friends, family members, or coworkers. The second step is setting boundaries. It's necessary. Boundaries act as filters, allowing in what's beneficial and keeping out what's harmful. The third step is to maintain a posture of love and prayer for them. 
Avoiding close engagement doesn't mean becoming indifferent or hateful. Love them and pray for them, but don't allow them to ridicule what's sacred to you. Now, moving on to number four, the tempter. Who are we addressing when we discuss the tempter? The tempter is an individual or even a situation that lures one into sin or away from faithfulness. This person or circumstance doesn't always appear overly evil or dangerous. Like a charmer, he can use good sounding words or kind words to draw you in. In fact, temptations often come in attractive and appealing forms, making them all the more perilous. The tempter could be a friend, a church member, a family member, a co-worker, or any situation that subtly encourages you to compromise your values. They often appeal to your desires, emotions, or perceived needs, offering momentary pleasure or relief while leading you astray in the long run. Being in the company of such individuals or situations can erode your spiritual foundation over time, making it essential to recognize and avoid them. The danger they pose is not only an immediate temptation, but also in the gradual drifting away from your spiritual anchor. The Bible warns in 1 Corinthians 15 verse 33, Do not be deceived, that company ruins good morals. We often think we're strong enough to resist temptation, believing we're rooted in our faith. However, the Bible warns us not to be deceived, as it's easy to fall into that trap. The problem isn't always the temptation itself. Sometimes it's the environment that makes giving in to temptation easier. So what can we do? First, be aware of your vulnerabilities and recognize where you are most susceptible to temptation. Second, evaluate your company. Surround yourself with people who can hold you accountable, not those who draw you into temptation. Third, always have an escape plan, as the Bible promises that God will provide a way out of temptation. Seek it out. And if you resist the devil, he will flee from you. Lastly, number five, let's discuss the self-centered individual. The self-centered individual is someone whose primary focus is on themselves, often at the expense of others. They leave those around them feeling undervalued or neglected. Philippians 2 verse 4 instructs, Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Don't let someone in your inner circle who is self-centered and not God-centered. This is the essence of Christian community, mutual support, mutual encouragement, and mutual growth. However, a self-centered individual stands in stark contrast to this essence. A relationship with such an individual resembles a 1A street with everything flowing toward them. Your needs, interests, and growth become secondary or even irrelevant to them. This can be emotionally and spiritually draining, depleting your resources and affecting your other relationships and your connection with God. So what's the course of action? First, recognize the signs of a self-centered person as it's not always about blatant acts of selfishness but often the subtler things. Now these people that I have mentioned, if it is someone close to you, you can talk to them about it privately. Doing it publicly won't resolve the problem. Be careful not to condemn them but to come from a place of love and wanting the best for this person. If they reject your words, withdraw yourself and do not escalate the situation. Simply pray for them. 2 Timothy 2 verse 24 says, A servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but must be kind to everyone, be able to teach, and be patient with difficult people. I know it is not easy, so pray about it. Dear Heavenly Father, as we unite our hearts in prayer, we lift up our gratitude for all those who are opening their hearts to you at this moment. We join together in seeking your guidance and wisdom, surrendering our relationships, choices, and every facet of our lives into your loving and capable hands. Lord, may our hearts be aligned with your divine will. Mold us, guide us, and use us for your glory. We thank you for hearing and answering our prayers in the name of Jesus.